Hi, everyone. Welcome to this breakout session on opening space. With us, we have Shrestha Haziz. Um, she's a journalist, a writer, a campaigner, an Oxford City Councillor, and a stand-up comedian. I couldn't leave that out. Uh, I've had the privilege of watching her speak in Rhodes House earlier. And I must say that there's no one who's more thoughtful, experienced, and kind that I can think of to speak on this topic. So we're so glad to have you. Aww, what a nice um, introduction. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I thought I'd kick us off by just uh, recounting an article that I read the other day. So it was the BBC in 2017 after the election triumphantly declaring that this parliament was the most diverse ever. So 45 out of 650 MPs were LGBT, mm -hmm. 52 were ethnic minorities, which is 8%, which is close enough to 14% of the broader population. Um, 208 women, so that's 32%, which is kind of 50%, if you round it up. Uh, and um, only 29% went to private schools, as opposed to 7% in the broader population. So Only 29%. Only 29%. What can you do? Yeah. So, um, I guess the question is quite simple. Is this the best time ever to be a minority po a politician in um, the United Kingdom? Is this the age of golden diversity? Well, first of all, um, I was going to say good morning, but it is the morning, isn't it? Good morning, everyone. Lovely to be here. Thank you for the invite. Um, so, to answer your question, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, uh, we are living in very uh, dangerous times, but also exciting times. Um, everything is shifting, the status quo is shifting, the fact that we're having this discussion here, the fact this uh, conference is taking place, the fact that uh, decolonization keeps coming up, and uh, we've heard the words looting, which were music to my ears earlier on. Uh, all the rest of it shows that something is profoundly shifting. However, let's be very clear, let's not get all romantic and misty-eyed about this. We have a mainstreaming of racism in all its forms and bigotry and misogyny in very accelerated ways and ways we've not seen for a very, very long time. Horrifically, our political systems are perpetuating this and are being impacted by this. So uh, while it's very, very important to acknowledge the progress that's being made in terms of the type of people who are now coming through for, uh, politically, not only here in the United States, across the world, we have to look at the flip side of that and what it costs um, in terms of people's mental health, their physical health, the threat to their lives, so, for example, here in the United Kingdom, uh, in the last few years, there's been a massive increase in the type of targeting of people in public and political life. And specifically, the targeting is directed towards women of colour, specifically black women. So if you look at Diane Abbott, the Shadow Home Secretary, if you look at all the trolling and all the racism online, Amnesty International's data shows that if you added all of the, M the, the kind of, you know, targeting of MPs, Diane Abbott would still be way ahead by herself when it comes to the way she's targeted. And that's because misogyny and racism and anti-blackness collide every single day when it comes to Diane Abbott and the way she's treated publicly. So we need to be very clear about this. Also, I think this word diversity is a word that needs to be scrapped myself because it doesn't really mean anything. And what we're finding is the language of, um, you know, the kind of the discourse around race, around representation is being co-opted by the very people who are creating the misery. Um, so if you look at the United States of America, why were Ilhan, why has Ilhan Omar in particular been targeted? Why has Rashi, Rashida been targeted? Why are black women and women of colour being targeted? Why are question marks being raised about whether they really belong there? Why was Barack Obama called the part Kenyan pr uh, president uh, by, the, the, sadly, the, the British Prime Minister, the current one? And it goes on and it goes on. So we have to celebrate our wins. I'm a firm believer in that. We have to celebrate every single one of our wins, but we also have to be on high alert, and we have to question the way this narrative is being put together, especially when it comes to representation, because there isn't much. Mm. And for me, I'm not going to celebrate someone being brown or gay if their politics are anti-gay and anti-human human rights, because otherwise, if I do that, I'm, I'm actually feeding into tokenism. Mm. And I believe in 2019, we need to move everything on. We do not need tokenism. That's actually something that I wanted to touch on a little bit about the tokenism versus true representation question. So when you have someone like Priti Patel up there and she is 
someone who is the first ever Indian origin Home Secretary. Um, she's the kind of person that little Indian boys and girls can look up to and say, I can see myself now in those shoes, even if I'd never been able to do that before. Do you think that's representation? Do you think that's progress? Well, what I found fascinating about Priti Patel uh, and uh, Sajid Javid was the British media's deep desire to create a narrative around how everyone who's brown needs to celebrate these people, and if you don't, it's because you, you don't like their politics. This was a this was a very popular narrative mm -hmm. that's, that came into um, uh, full flow when they were appointed in their positions. Now, that to say that is basically to say, let's all go and start celebrating tokenism. Now, you talked about little Indian girls and boys. I don't know every single Indian girl or boy, and I'm not sure every single one of them would be celebrating them. I'll tell you who's not celebrating Priti Patel uh, getting the, the role that she has, and that is three British children aged six, eight, and 10, who, through no fault of their own, were born in the battlefield in, in Syria, or they were taken there by their British parents, and Priti Patel is blocking them from returning to this country, which is, they're British, and these are British orphans mm. who are languishing in a refugee camp full of extremists, where there is no rule of law, and where the likelihood of them being indoctrined, if they haven't already been indoctrined, is very, very high. So, I mean, what, what, she's not a champion of diversity and representation for those children, and she's certainly not a, di a champion of diversity and representation for the ancestors of the Windrush generation, and indeed the victims of the Windrush generation are still looking for justice. Um, she's presiding over the Home Office, which quite frankly is a crime scene when it comes to Windrush. It needs to be cordoned off, <laughs> and we need to find where all those documents are, and indeed we now know where a lot of those documents are. So this is why we have to be really careful. I have never in my life gone into a room and said, oh, hello, I'm a Muslim woman, because I think it's fairly obvious I'm not wearing a lampshade on my head. <laughs> um, but beyond that, I'm not, I'm not here to represent all Muslims. I'm here to represent the people who voted for me and those who didn't vote for me. And in fact, I'm just going to wrap up on this one point. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was locking on doors in Rose Hill in Ifley, and a man, a very, very angry, agitated man, opened the door. And he said, I said, oh, good morning, sir. I'm your, I'm your counsellor. He said, no, you're not. I didn't vote for you. He was very angry. And he kept going on about Brexit, OK? So I, said, I let him finish. And then I said, well, I'm still your, I'm still your counsellor. He said, I did not vote for you. I said, but I represent your neighbourhood. And so it's my job to stand here and to listen to you and to make sure if you need something that I represent you. And then he just went very quiet. Quiet, and he calmed down, and then we still had a ridiculous conversation. That didn't change, um, but the tone in the conversation changed, and and that's the thing. You know, we've got to get to a point now. Where we're at a point where the political discourse. I don't even know if you can really use that word. Is so off the scale that no one is listening to anyone anymore and no one is having a dialogue and that's what we need to get back to but holding a dialogue is not about appeasing bigotry and racism and homophobia and everything else because that's actually called bigotry and homophobia and everything else right there's a big difference between that and having a dialogue um on this last note of your experience as a city councillor actually Really curious to hear what your experience has been like. This is a city you were born and raised in, mm -hmm. and it's truly your own. And yet, I imagine that it's being a city dominated by a university such as this, which takes up so much space in people's minds and in the physical geography. Um, I'd love to hear more about what it means to represent a city like this. Yeah, well, this is my city, yeah. and uh, I'm a very proud citizen of nowhere. Hello, Theresa May. Um, but at the same time, you know, I feel very lucky because I have roots. And I think to ha I, as, you, as I get older, I understand the importance of having roots. It, it does, you know, without making an obvious statement, it grounds you. And I think in the current crisis that we're in everywhere, you do need that. You need, you need to be able to root yourself. You need to be able to plant your feet firmly on the ground without the ground constantly moving. And I know a lot of people, and perhaps those in the room as well, don't have that. And, that, I know, and I really do understand how painful that is, okay? Um, so that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is, um, as someone born and raised in this city, I don't think much has changed, to be honest. Um, my very dear friend, Naomi, who went to school with me sitting there, um, we talk about this quite frequently. Um, I've got nieces and nephews, Naomi's got two lovely children. Nothing much has changed. When you say the University of Oxford is centred in this city, for the people of the city, it's not. Mm. It's actually not something... That's part of our lives, OK? Genuinely, it's not. Um, might come as a shock to some people. Um, we see it a bit like 
a kind of being a visitor in a museum. You know, you kind of look up from the bus. I mean, I remember saying to you, Naomi, when did you realise that you were from Oxford? And you said you looked up one day, the top double-decker, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and until then, right? So, you know, and so it's literally like that, where you're kind of looking around going, oh, right, okay, wait a minute. Um, so there's a massive disconnect between the town and gown. It's always been there. Um, this morning I was dropped off here by a really nice British Pakistani taxi driver. It turns out he doesn't live very far from me. And he said to me, what are you, what are you doing here? He's looking around, he's like, oh, I thought he was turning into Pretty Patel. I was like, excuse me, I'm from here. But no, he was like, you know, what are you doing here? And I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, what's going on in there? So I told him, he was like, oh. He said, well, well done. I said, thanks. <laughs> so that's someone from my city. So yeah. the point is, from a young age, no one's ever said to us as Oxfordians that you're not allowed to go here, you're not supposed to be here. We just know. Mm. We know that nobody who looks like us is in these places or spaces. They're not occupying these spaces. Um, to this day, I've never been in the Bodleian Library. People find this amazing. My nieces and nephews have never been there. Um, my brothers would never come into this building, not because no one's told them they can't come in, but they just know it's not for them. So I find all of these, I, th I think that this disconnect particularly now when everything is so much more polarised than ever before, there needs to be a discussion between the town and the gown, and the, tower, the, the gown needs to decide why it wants to have that discussion, like what's the purpose behind it. So I'm frequently invited by the colleges to come and talk and listen and all the rest of it, and at the end there's always some discussion about we need to get more diversity in here, and I'm like, why? And they can never really explain why beyond that it's a good thing to do. And it's like, okay, well, it's a very important thing to do, but how are you going to support those students? How are you going to make sure that once you've got them through the door, that they're not having even more profound, uh, you know, attacks on their mental health, you know, that, that they are, you can't just bring more people in unless you shift a culture of an institution. And that also applies to city council. So, um, when I go door knocking, when I particularly meet women of colour, and immigrant women in particular, similar to my mum when she first came to this country, they're really surprised. They're like, you're a city councillor? But equally so are white men, just so we're clear, right? Okay. Um, so I find that that's how I know that progress is being made. Because if you can get that level of shock and awe on two different, two different sides, then you know something's shifting. Mm. And I think, I'm just gonna end up on this point. I think what's really, really fascinating, and perhaps this is where some of the tension is, for want of a better word, I think people are starting to wake up and believe that politics belongs to them. Because when you've got the politics of the food banks and the homelessness crisis in this city, the, one of the richest cities in the world, these world famous colleges, you've got people sleeping in the doorstep, that's political, that's not, there's nothing, you can't dress it up, right? So I think when big institutions like the Labour Party and other parties, there were a big swathe of people who thought that party belonged to them, and now they've understood that there's a nightmare unfolding, which is it belongs to everyone, actually. And there are a lot of people who've been put off by politics, but if you look around the world, there's a real energy in people's movements, and it's really exciting, and you're seeing it everywhere in the world, and especially with the climate crisis, you're seeing increasing numbers of young people, particularly young women of colour, coming through, and that's not happening by accident, but it's, all, it's not happening because people are opening the doors to them and welcoming them, it's because people have started to work out that actually I have to not seek permission, yeah. I have to go out and do things, and I have to build solidarity. Mm. So I think that's, for me, that's the type of politics that are really exciting, and that's happening in Oxford as well. That's fascinating, and I'll ask a final question before opening it up to the audience, which is, uh, you said politics belongs to the people, and so ought ideally arts and the humanities as well. And that's something that we were talking about yesterday. Mm -hmm. How do you think about that in your role as a city councillor when deciding where the budget goes towards homelessness versus towards the arts? Um, when you're participating in an event like this, uh, which is quite exclusive, it's all university students or people associated with universities, how, how do you democratise not just politics, but also the arts and the humanities? Yeah, well, I think um, the arts have always been uh, part of human history. At the same time, in the Western world, art becomes very elitist. And when it's not, it becomes co-opted by the elite. So my family are from Pakistan, and the arts are part of, you know, the DNA of the country and the people's DNA. 
um, in a very different way to how you know it is here in Britain. So a quick example, okay? When I was at Cheney School, big up Cheney, um, I had the opportunity to play the cello. And it's because our um, music teachers were very keen to get working class kids to do these things, okay? So I took up the cello and my cello teacher did not understand anything about me, not because I was speaking foreign language, but because the concept of someone like me wanting to learn the cello was one that was not, didn't sit comfortably with her. So she spent all her time telling me that we, I needed to buy a piano to tune the cello. And I spent all my time telling her, uh, we don't have room in the house to have a piano. My parents don't have any money to buy a piano. And guess what? We don't want a piano, right? <laughs> so she kept doing this. And then in the end, God bless them, right? My parents bought me a Casio keyboard. And Mrs. Swan was not very happy, okay, when I told her this. I said, it even sounds like a piano if you press the right button. But she wasn't very impressed. But anyway, so I carried on playing the cello and I loved it. And you know what? It was really made me very, very happy. But in the end, I gave it up because I felt like it wasn't for me. So despite me being very strong-willed, um, I just realised that she kept frowning at me and I kind of knew that she didn't really want me to do this. And it's one of my biggest regrets in my life, okay? I wish I'd kept that going. Now, the reason why I mention that here is because in institutions like Oxford, music, culture, that's part of... That's, that's your cultural currency. That's how working-class kids get, an, get the opportunities they should have. It's through sport, it's through music, it's through the culture, it's through culture and through the arts. And when, you, when your government has been decimating all the you know, funding, and when you've got big pharmaceutical companies now uh, and, and British P Petroleum, for heaven's sake, um, sponsoring shows uh, and art to places like the Tate Modern, I mean, then you know things have gone very badly wrong. Um, so here's the thing, right, newsflash, there's plenty of money in this country there's, there's plenty of money in this institution, that much we do know. But there's plenty of money, it, it should not be one or the other, it should not be a zero-sum game. One of the things that we have to start doing in this country is joining up the dots, um, public policy-wise, and healthy, equal, just societies, arts and humanities are at the centre of those societies. And you see it everywhere. You see it, in, this is not like pie-in-the-sky thinking, you see it, it's, it's happening for real in lots of parts of the world. Um, and I think that's what we need to get back to. So I, I'm not going to go into the zero-sum game of we need to either wipe out homelessness or we need to make sure, you know, everyone has access to the arts because it has to be both. And the final thing I'll wrap up on... Um, Last uh, Saturday, I was at Wembley Stadium uh, because the England women's football team were playing Germany. And it was, it was, his, it was historical because 77,000 something people were there. It's one of the biggest audiences ever for the women's football game. Now, I took my nieces, uh, one's 14, one's 16, and her two friends, two friends, both are daughters of immigrants, uh, both are white, lovely white girls. They've never been on a train before in their lives. I didn't know this, they told me that. They said, we've never been on a train before, we've never been to Wembley before. So we're having these discussions, and what I found really interesting was that they were mesmerised by seeing women playing football. <coughs> and through this one short trip, you know, one of, the, one of the girls said to me, I want to start playing football. It was, it was immediate, it was instant. There was, like, no... You know, she was very clear, right? And um, she was... It was like something in their minds changed. And even though none of those footballers really looked like those girls, they, under, they, they, felt like, they felt excited by it. And it was really humbling for me because, you know, I'm someone who has spent my entire life um, having access to people in places I should never have access to because of my background, OK? And one of the reasons why I think I've managed to do that is because I learned very early on how to swim rather than sinking. And I learned that a lot of the, these rooms are full of bluff and bluster. And you just have to stand your ground. But it's harder now for people of my background to do that than any other time. Because then, at school, I was, I was given the opportunity to play the cello, right? I had teachers who believed in me. And now, schools are closing early. You know, teachers are running around. You know, I'm, I'm a governor of a school. We're handing out bagels at bre breakfast. We've got breakfast clubs going on in this city, in one of the richest cities in the whole world, as I keep saying. So, you know, the, the, the tensions and the pressures are changing. And so we have to think about what we're going to do to support those young people. Um, and, and I just think that it's, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? When you open up young people's worlds everything changes for them. It could just be for an hour, it could be for a day, it could be for the afternoon when I went to Wembley with the girls, it, it, but something triggers in them. And then what we have to do is we have to make sure it's sustainable. So, yeah. yeah. 
And on the note of opening up the world, I'll open up the floor mm -hmm. for questions. Yeah. Hi, um, thanks for your presentation. Um, I'm an alum, um, literally this is year 10. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I remember um, exactly that division that you're talking about, the division between town and gown, um, because I did something very unusual um, relative to Oxford is that I played pool, billiards, um, as my sport. And that was the only sport that involved training in so like down the Cowley Road, like you were in a very local bar. There's no other Oxford people in the entire room and, and being able to make friendships because the coaches are all um, local people who have nothing to do with Oxford, have never even set foot in, in, in terms of the university and got a completely different experience of Oxford from what you get from being in the college sort of um, or this sort of side of town. Um, I say this as a preamble because um, in 2010, I was also here for the election mm -hmm. and being a Commonwealth student uh, had the opportunity to vote um, and you saw that division sort of play out in how the difference between how um, this area kind of swung more Lib Dem and the rest of the county kind of stayed uh, Tory, uh, the rest of the constituencies. And um, when I think about that and I think about the state of British politics today and the number of Oxford PPEs um, that are running around forgetting that Northern Ireland is part of this <laughs> country. Um, I wonder from your perspective as a person who represents um, Oxford, you know, a part of Oxford, what do you think that this sort of state of play, number one, says about the division between the university and the, and the town and where it is? Is it changing? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? And whatever. And number two, and um, do you think that Brexit is an indictment of the Oxford PPE? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's uh, let's start with the easy bit. Yes, it is. Um, and thank you so much for asking that question. Um, I think it's really important you ask that question. So thank you. Um, frankly speaking, it's not a good look for Oxford, is it? We smog. You know, I was going to say Trump, but no, let's not hold Boris, Oxford yeah. responsible for Trump. Um, Rhys Mogg, uh, Boris Johnson. I refuse to call him Boris. The guy's not Beyonce, all right? You know? <laughs> the thing is, this is the thing, right? The media, we, we, un we, we start, th this language, it starts seeping in mm -hmm. and it becomes so normalized. I absolutely refuse to call him Boris. The guy's not Madonna. He's not Ronaldo. He's not Beyonce. He's Boris Johnson. Let's hold him to account, okay? He was never held to account when he was here by all accounts. If you read all the, you know, backstory on Boris Johnson and what he was actually really doing here, re-smog, all of these people, I, I, think it's, I think it's a damning indictment of class, of privilege, of white privilege, in particular white male privilege, of elitism. And I think there should be more discussions about this and we should be asking ourselves, what is the purpose of having a world a uh, world-renowned elite institution like this? What is its purpose in terms of what it's producing at the end of the three or four years or whatever? Now, just to be clear, there are obviously many, many fantastically brilliant students who go through these doors, and a lot of them are not privileged, and they fight every day to be here. And I know, because I know quite a few of them, and they're out, actually, they're the ones doing all the volunteering. They're out doing the soup runs. They're out, you know, making sure that the person sleeping in the doorway of the world-famous you know, college is not dying of hypothermia. And I don't say that in a jokey way, by the way. They're the ones doing the work. They're the ones trying to build these bridges. So where is everyone else? So actually, I think what Brexit has done, it's like an onion where you just, uh, not the onion, by the way, um, but you kind of, you're just peeling back. And the more you're peeling back, the more eye-watering and astonishing it becomes that nobody wants to get to the, the core of what's going on. Um, and I think that's what Brexit's done. And I think the other thing that Brexit's done is it's really shaken the elite, established elite in this country because they don't know what to do anymore. Like once upon a time, ring, the power was ring fenced for them. And in many ways, these walls and these gates, and that's what they are, um, protect you from the real world, but you can't, there's no protection anymore because the real world is everywhere, it's in your face. And as someone from this city, 
In my entire life, the university as an institution, the University of Oxford, let's not forget we have two universities in this city, um, it's never had anything to do with me my entire life. When Brexit happened, I've been invited into every college to talk about everything and anything, and I'm not stupid, right? I know what's going on. One of the reasons is people are like, oh, good Lord, we don't know what's going on. It's like, no, you don't. Well, some of us live real lives, and I don't live... You know, I've got a very good life, just to be clear. I'm not living the life of people forced to exist on food banks while working three jobs, OK? I'm not, I'm not having to make decisions about whether I'm going to heat my home or feed my children. That's not a decision, by the way, right? So I'm not living that life, but I, am, I have close proximity to people living that life, which is increasingly the vast majority of people in this very rich country, because I'm working with people every day who are living this reality. But I think responsibility must be taken by this institution, and in particular, by the Oxford Union. I'd like to see some responsibility being taken there. Um, you know, uh, I've been very vocal about the fact that, you know, the disgrace that is the Oxford Union, where they think it's OK to keep inviting the likes of Steve Bannon and all these people in to our city. And this is the thing, right? This is where Oxford... Th I think this has been one of the most, like kind of stark examples of the divide between the town and the gown because there's constant chat about, oh, you know, the university's like, union's got nothing to do with us, nothing to do with us, they run things by themselves. Meanwhile, we've got swastikas sprayed on the walls of our city and I'm on my way to school with my nieces and I'm seeing them and I'm reporting them to the police. So the point is, the way we live or the way we, the way we exist or we don't exist with each other directly impacts each of us, okay? It directly impacts us. Why is it that there's only three colleges in this institution who want to play, pay the Oxford living wage to non-academic staff. What a disgrace. House prices in this country are 11 times the salary. When you've got massively wealthy institutions like this refusing to pay the living wage, how do you think people in the city live? How do you think we, we make ends meet? Whenever I go into these colleges, I feel like I'm in a scene of Alice in Wonderland, right? Literally, you open the ye oldy door and I'm like, wow, this is my city? I didn't know this. You know, you may as well have deer jumping around, right? There's lakes, there's rivers. Yeah, you right? do. Yeah. yeah, OK, you do. OK, yeah. well, do, do, do let me know. Yeah. I'll, I'll come for that, right? But on a serious note, I'm just like, damn, well, this is our city. This is really interesting because, you know, um, there's kids here who um, don't have access to football pitches and they want to play football on a Sunday. And guess what? They don't want to be transported into Oxford. In Rose Hill and Ifley, where I've got the extreme honour of being a councillor, children don't come to the city centre. They, don't, they come once a year, OK? They don't, there's no need for them to be here. It's not, it's not kind of like what it's kind of... Uh, how it's sold to the students. It's, um, there's a massive disconnect. And I think that that must shift. And I also think the city council has to shift the way it views the university, because it's very much cap in hand, kind of, you know, oh, hello, we're not worthy type thing. It's like, well, actually, we are worthy. This is our city, and it belongs to all of us, including the students. You know, I think it's important. You, you, you know, you're coming here to study, but then you also need to ask yourself questions about why, what am I really doing here? Now, sorry, what was the first bit of your question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, she was talking about the town gun distinction. Town so, gun, yeah. 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 But also, there's really good... OK, yeah. better or worse? Well, inequality is through the roof, OK? This country is now one of the most unequal countries in the whole of Europe, second only to Estonia. I rest my case. Um, it is absolutely disgraceful. So I think the time... I know, that, I know very good work is being done here as well, by the way, just to be very clear, OK? I like to try and be nuanced. I know it's a very rare thing, but I do try. Um, but I'm not saying it's all terrible, but what I'm saying is we've got to shift gears faster. OK, we can't just keep talking about these things. We've got to see action. And to be fair, whenever I've reached out to a college through brilliant students who have this awareness, there's been a really powerful response. So, for example, very quickly, I approached um, someone who I know really loves rugby and loves football, a student here, and he helped me access some money to then give to um, uh, a Sunday football uh, club, OK? And they were then able to buy football shirts. That's a really powerful thing, but it can't just be a one-off. It has to be a continuation. It can't just be like, you know, you get one trip a year somewhere and that's it. Um, so those are the things I'd like to change. And yes, it is getting worse. I mean, just look at the homelessness issue. It's really stark, you know? So yeah, it's getting worse and we've all got a role to play and I really hope we start playing it. Thank you. Yeah, the mic's just coming. <coughs> 
Actually, this, this question is for you, right? Okay. Um, a couple of years, about 18 months ago, I had a conversation with Carly J, and she was leading up a social action group within the Rhodes community. Okay, yeah. And that sounded like great. Is that still progressing? And what's been the fruit of that? Because this issue of you know, students living isolated lives, and, and particularly the Rhodes yeah. community, you've got this commitment to be engaged. Yeah. So that seems to be one vehicle of actually trying to do that. How, what sort of progress, what, 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 what are the fruits of that in terms of the yeah. community? Um, so I haven't been personally involved with this, and if anyone else in the audience has, you should speak to it. But I think that in of itself says a lot in that we've got a two-day conference with incredible food for, uh, to talk about entrepreneurship and the humanities and all of these other things. But it's, it's not quite the same focus that we've got on um, initiatives such as this one. So I think there's definitely a question of institutional focus in terms of what we as a community and the higher ups as an organization choose to spend our time and resources thinking about. Um, but in, with regard to the particular initiative, I think if anyone else knows more about it, you should speak to it. Um, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, on that specific question, we'll be happy to engage a bit later. If, if it's all right, I want to direct a question to Shaista. Um, if it's all right, Shaista, I want to refer to something you mentioned by email um, about not, a disconnect not only between town and gown, but even the councillors um, are out of touch in various ways. Mm. Um, so thinking about mm. representatives of neighbourhoods and of yeah. constituencies. It's identity as well, doesn't it? Yeah, and, thank you. And, 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 I guess the question is, um, having spent so much time now with your fellow councillors, what is your diagnosis of why they are so out of touch? And if you're sort of thinking about how they develop, so whatever stage that they enter into local politics, do you think that these are childhood experiences that sort of get them so out of touch? Is it what they're doing in university? Is it adult professional experiences? If you had, to, if you had one life stage to intervene in these people's socialization, to get them more on the ground and in touch, where would you intervene? Okay. Well, thank you for that question. I think the, my colleagues should be asked the same question about me as well, by the way, so I'm sure they've got views on me too. Um, but I think what I'd say to that question, which is really important, is if you look at the makeup of any council anywhere in this country, it's, there's a pattern, okay? Uh, usually the pattern is they're, much, they're usually older, and obviously with age comes wisdom, allegedly. Um, but it is, there's a demographic, it's usually white male or, or white women of a certain age. Um, in the last few years, that is starting to shift. But if I give you an example as to like the difference between here and Manchester, for example, I, I lived in Manchester for five years. It's a brilliant city, uh, very different to ours, obviously. Um, and one of the reasons why it's different, I think, is because it has that really strong working class history, which then does definitely, um, you know, seep into its politics. Mm -hmm. But if you're a city councillor in Manchester, you, you will get paid £17,000 a year, which is not a great salary, but it's you can manage on that. In Oxford, you get paid £300 a month for your travel expenses. Now, if you're living in a city where your house prices are 11 times the national average, this is the most expensive city in, in the country to live in, and you want to engage in politics, then really, that's a luxury, isn't it? Because if it, being a councillor is actually a very intense full-time job. Um, there's a lot of casework. If you want to do it properly, then you know, you're going to spend time investing in doing your job properly. If you're going to be paid £300 a month, you need to be working on top of that. So um, most councillors have jobs, and those who don't are retired. And when you're retired, then obviously you're part of a certain demographic. So that itself gives you an idea of, of why democracy looks the way that it does and it feels the way that it does, right? Um, and these are very practical barriers towards improving real representation and getting voices in of people from this city. And so the barriers start very early on. And these are barriers that you can't really overcome because you, you've got to pay your rent, you've got to pay your bills. You're not going to pay them on £300 a month, are you? Um, so these are some of the challenges um, that are there. And the other thing is, I think just generally, Brexit, I think, has uh, obviously polarised this country beyond anything. But it's also really exposed the way we live, uh, the way many of us live, which many, many people, the 1%, 
live in the bubble world and everybody else is just struggling to get by. And that's what it's done. And so I think it's stripped that bear and, it, and it's still, and it's, it's kind of, it's very uncomfortable, isn't it, for a lot of people to know that if you think you, this is not about a judgment about whether you're a good person or a bad person, by the way, but if you see yourself as a good person, then it's hard to kind of be able to, um, you know, align that with the fact that, oh, I, I thought I knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you don't know what's going on because you're not reaching out to people. One of the things um, that really, there's a lot of political language that really winds me up, but one term is the hard to reach. So no one's hard to reach, right? Obviously, you should be reaching out to them without their consent in the first place, but you know, there's, no, there's no such thing as hard to reach. There's, it's just nonsense. It's language and discourse that's been created deliberately to kind of disguise what's going on. And so I think, um, the fact that on our cabinet, for example, here in Oxford, I was told that temporarily or short, I can't remember exactly what it was, but there was one person of colour. Apart from that, there's never been a person of colour on the cabinet where you have a portfolio in this city. Now, Oxford has got one of the largest, and I don't like these terms, but nonetheless, BAME, black ethnic minority populations outside of London. So how do we, how do we square that? How do we actually really deal with that? Um, so, you know, th these are the facts. So you can just look at them. You know, it's not about opinion. It's about facts there. Um, so I think there's a lot of work that's changing. Yeah. And like I said, one of the outrages I'm seeing in, in particularly um, in the media is, you know, the fact that the, kind of like the great unwashed think the politics is for them. Well, yeah, it is for them because, you know, they're the ones who are dealing with the brunt of these horrific policies that are being made um, that are destroying their lives. Um, so I think that we have to get better at having these uncomfortable conversations and, uh, and then actually acting, because we can't just keep talking, we need action as well. So I hope that answers your question. Hi, Shay. So thanks so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I've got a number of questions, but hopefully this one that I um, posed to you kind of distills tells what I'm trying to get across. But you're obviously very passionate about um, working class, working class backgrounds and so forth, which is, is great to see. How do you grapple with and disentangle uh, different views that may be found within the working class, such as, um, well, within a part of the working class, such as, you know, returning to a, a Britain of old, um, this, this whole uh, notion um, that, that is um, arguably driven a big part of um, this movement towards Brexit. I'm interested in kind of yeah. figuring out how do you grapple with these different views within that. Yeah. And I guess to sort of deepen that question, there's often the expectation that minorities or those who've endured trauma are perfect, like you, but we're, we're not, we're deeply imperfect. We can be brown and sexist, we can be brown and yes. racist towards other people of other races. Brown so, and pretty Patel. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and yeah, so if you could just think of yeah. disentangle yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, you know, it, it, um, first of all, thank you for your question again. Um, you know, the narrative in this country, the political discourse in this country forever and a day, when it comes to the working class, it's always the white working class. All politicians of all stripes, of all parties, whenever they talk about the working class, they always refer to the white working class. It's an absolute disgrace. It's part of the, there's a part of the erasure of this country's history, which, you know, this country's very good at that, right? Um, so I always start from that point. I always say, well, first of all, the working class is everyone. OK, it's the workers from all backgrounds, including my family. My dad came here when he was 16 years old. He uh, was a trade unionist his entire life. I know it's very fashionable to be the child of a transport worker. I'm not going to go into Sajid Javid territory or Sadiq Khan territory on that one. But I am the proud daughter of um, you know, a transport worker. OK, I'll stop there. You'd be pleased to hear. But anyway, so the point is, you know, the, we've always been part of the working classes. That's, that's the way the working class function. It's, there's a clue in the title, workers, right? Um, but that history is always erased. So that's the first thing. And that's how you end up having these narratives where you're pitting people up against each other. So the Brexit um, narrative, uh, the, the, the popular one, is that it's the working class who's delivered Brexit. But if you look at all the data, it's the people in the home counties who delivered Brexit. And also, it's a fact, uh, people of colour, including the working classes, voted for Brexit. And when you ask them why, uh, the, the responses are often laced with xenophobia and racism, particularly towards Eastern Europeans, obviously, but, uh, but also towards black people. Um, 
And that is about, uh, that's what happens when xenophobia is rising and when open racism is rising, it's survival of the fittest. So, you know, I, I mean, I must be very clear here and say that I do feel extra disgusted by people of colour who then sprout racism for obvious reasons, right? Um, but I do find that very difficult to kind of, you know, be able to sort of uh, listen to because I'm thinking, hello, have you looked at yourself in the mirror? Please do take a look, right? Um, but that, that's how political systems, that's what they're there for. They're there to pit people up against each other. And at the end of the day, workers, if, we ha if workers have rights, then we all have rights. And we've got into this debate um, in this country, and it's all about zero-sum game. You know, if, if, if a trans woman has her rights, I won't have my rights as a woman. Well, guess what, woman? You don't get to define womanhood for everyone. Um, and the same thing goes for the working classes as well. I think um, the working classes in this country have been scapegoated for absolutely everything forever in a day, and that's continuing. And uh, there, is no, there is no utopian harmony between members of the working classes either, and that's coming through because of Brexit as well. Um, and I think we just need to drill down and get to, get to what the, what's actually really going on. And like I said to you, I'm someone who travels the country a lot. I spend a lot of time moving around for work. And I have the most incredible conversations with people. And nine times out of 10, it's because my appearance is a trigger for a lot of people and there's a lot of anger and the anger just starts coming out and often people are quite surprised themselves so i'm going to wrap up really quickly on this story in relation to your question right because very very quickly i was in headington i was door knocking a young man um uh, he i knocked on his door he wasn't there he suddenly arrived we had a conversation the first thing he said to me is um he said are he was pointing his finger at me he said are you going to stand up for the white working class are you, are you, he's doing all of this. And he said, if you're not, you're a racist. I said, okay, are you, are you done? He said, yeah. So I said, well, I'm here to stand up for everyone. He said, yeah, but what about the white working class? I said, excuse me, I am part of the working class. My dad gave him the story. So then he listened, and then he said he's got three degrees and he can't get a job here in Oxford. He was very distressed, and he said it's because all the Chinese students have infiltrated the University of Oxford, at which point I did take a deep breath. But anyway, this conversation continued, and they got very fraught, and he got very agitated, and then in the end, okay, he started crying. A grown man I've never met before in my life is sobbing his heart out, and it's, for me, it was devastating because it sums up broken Britain and a lack of hope, okay? This young, intelligent, articulate, I'm sure he's a very nice man, genuinely, uh, is standing there sobbing his heart out. And then he apologised to me, so I'm so sorry for how I'm talking to you. This is not the man I am. And he said, I keep going online, and this did send a slight shudder down my spine. So I'm going online, and he said, I'm getting angrier and angrier because I'm starting to believe what's being said, okay? And then we ended up having a conversation about politics. And then I suggested he goes to the local branch of the Labour Party, and I thought, God only knows what will happen when he goes there. <laughs> but you might be triggered even more. But anyway, um, you know, I just said to him, look, you know, I said, the fact that we're having this conversation, like, it's incredible when you just show up and you don't... I'm not here to hug racists and make them feel better, OK? But this guy's not a racist. I'm not here to condemn him as being a racist. I understand there's a lot of deep pain and there's no hope. Yeah. And you've got, to go and be, you've got to go and face people. You've got to listen to them. If you choose to be a public figure, then you, that's your job. Don't, you know, don't hide away from people. When you say you've got to listen to them, do you mean you as in public figures or you as in each one of us in the room? Because I'm really sorry you have to go through that experience, and it sounds really that's hard. That's very tame, that experience, Yeah, by the way. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I can't even imagine. But the question then becomes, for each and every one of us in this room, what, how does that play out into our personal life? Should we be making efforts with those who exhibit racism in the hope that they're not racists and kind of trying to break them down? Well, I think the job is not for people who are a threat to be mm. breaking down racists, just to be clear. Um, there's more outrage in this country at being called a racist than there is actual racism. <laughs> And this is a growing phenomenon, and it's absolutely disgraceful, OK? So let's be very clear about that. I'll make it very clear. I'm not here to hug Nazis and make them feel better. Got no time for that. The world's in flames. Got better things to do in my time, OK? However, I do feel that we as a country and as people in, in communities and societies, when, when the fear is growing out there, when people are scared of each other, mm. How, how are we going to change anything if we're scared of each other? We've got to start taking those steps and we've got to start having 
very difficult and comfortable conversations. And we've got, I mean, it's going to sound a bit, you know, like let's all get the violin out, right? But genuinely, it's a thing called humanity. We've got to start engaging with each other. And we've got to start having conversations. I mean, one of the, um, I was in Wolverhampton about two years ago and there was a guy in a wheelchair and uh, he, I, was, I was in a hotel and he was trying to get out of the door. So basically I just did what any one of us is supposed to do, which is hold the door open, right? So we ended up having a conversation because very rare, in the spaces I occupy, very few people who look like me are in those spaces, all right? So he started talking to me, and then he said, you know, he said, can I just say something, madam? And that's usually, it's 50%. <laughs> it could go one way or the other, right? And believe me, it goes both ways sometimes. I was like, oh, God, here we go. I said, yes, go on, ting, you know, to, to a smile. And he said, um, I just don't believe a word of what they say about people like you. And I said, well, what do you mean, people from Oxford? He was like, no. He's like, going off into one, right? Muslims. I was like, oh, OK, well, cheers. Let's have a handshake there, right? But he was very... Um, he was very clear. He said, you know, I used to live in Oxford. He said, I was a postman there. So we had a conversation about that more than anything else. And at the end, he said, I don't believe in a word of what they say about you. Mm. And I was like, OK. So I feel that sometimes people are waiting to have those conversations. They want to have them, but they don't know how to have them. Mm. Because British people spend a lot of time swallowing their words and uh, very oppressed. And so what happens <laughs> is when I go into rooms, right, a lot of white people want to save me, genuinely. They're like, oh, poor woman, you know. And then they discover after about 30 seconds that actually they've, they're quite oppressed. I'm very liberated. I'm OK. No drone strikes were involved in liberating me. I got there by myself. Um, so then, then, then that starts happening. And that's, that's, that's because we are mirrors to each other, aren't we? OK? And that's another reason why I get a lot of attitude, for want of a better word, because people want me to be who they think I am. And I'm like, well, I can only be me. I don't know what you're thinking. I've, I've got too busy to want, worry about that. Um, so, yeah, so I don't think it's a job of the marginalised and those who are um, suffering these oppressions to dismantle it. I think it's a job of everybody else to be allies and to work together and be compassionate and try and be nice to each other. It really works, mm. right? Um, shouting, screaming at each other, it doesn't work. Equally, being nice to people who just want you, who, who are questioning your humanity, that's not gonna work either. Somewhere in between, let's get into that space in between. Um, and let's, let's not be scared of each other, basically. We have time for one last question. Anything you can have? Yes, yes. Um, just thank you for um, your sharing your liberated thoughts with us. Uh, it's <laughs> truly a joy to hear. Um, my name is Dakane. I am not from Oxford. I live in Australia. I was born in Afghanistan, and um, my family migrated there in the 80s at the height of the Cold War. Um, so I, I, what you've said really resonates with me about the tokenism and kind of people um, placing these assumptions of who they think you should be in spaces. So I've loved hearing you talk about that. But my question is, um, being outside of the UK and the political system here, there's obviously a lot of resonances in what's happening globally in terms of politics. Um, what, is your, what are your thoughts, what are your experiences on being politically active at the local level um, compared to kind of this centralization of power and this complete erasure of other voices that's happening quite um, uh, epidemically, I guess, um, around the Western world and, and even in countries like India, we've heard. Um, what are your reflections on where local government um, and local politics sits in shifting those uh, global narratives of yeah. politics? Well, again, thank you for that really great question. So for me, uh, the local, the national and the international all connected. Um, I think for too long, all of these different layers have been kept separate and that's been done on purpose by people with power so they can accumulate more power and so um, they can tell you to stay in your lane and focus on that but it's all interconnected so you know I can't you know I can't leave what makes me me at the door when I walk into the town hall I'm sure some people would love it if I did but I'm not going to do that and I'm not going to pretend to not be all the things that I am and to not and to uh, I'm not going to pretend that I don't understand 
what's going on because of my experiences and because of my background and all the rest of it. So all of these are interconnected. So for example, um, in Oxford, uh, my, my mum came here when she was 20, okay? 21, 22, I think she was. She's now uh, heading towards her 70s, right? Now, there's still generations of women from my mum's age who still, who live, who've lived here all their lives, raised children here, but they don't speak English. Um, they don't have a bank account. Um, they don't go out very often by themselves. Um, now, are, am I going to start saying, well, that's a local issue, that's a, you know, how, you know, what, what is all of that about? Does that mean that they don't have agency? No. Does it mean they don't, they're not active citizens? No. Does it mean that they don't participate in democracy? No. Does it not mean that they don't contribute to the city and this country? No. Right? So it's about how, it's about how we, how we um, value people as human beings and the contributions they make. Now, to be very clear, I, would, I think their lives perhaps might be easier if they did speak English, some of these women, and if they, if they did want to venture out. But frankly speaking, if you look at the environment that's being created in this country, a lot of people don't feel safe going out anymore. Um, one, uh, one other quick example I'm going to give you. As a woman who has a lot of agency, much to many people's horror, um, and, and you know, the first thing people say to me is, you're very confident. I'm like, is there a reason why I shouldn't be? And they're like, no. I'm like, excellent. <laughs> Let's move on then, right? But anyway, so I was out and about, okay? And uh, this was about two years, no, three years ago. And I was coming late, coming home late, and something had happened somewhere horrific in Europe. And uh, as a result, my family said to me, you need to make sure that if you're coming home late, we don't, we, you need to get in a taxi. We don't want you out, right? We're very worried about your safety. So anyway, I get in a taxi. I get to Oxford. I was in London. Um, and uh, a taxi driver, again, young British Pakistani guy, because guess what? Very little social mobility in this country, let alone in this city, OK? I'm sure he's happy being a taxi driver as well, just to be clear, but nonetheless, right? So anyway, so he starts talking to me. Nice guy. We have a chat. And he says, oh, um, not being funny or anything, again, uh, God knows what's going to come next. And he said, if you don't mind me saying something, I said, let's hear it, right? He said, if you were my sister or my mother, I, wouldn't, I would be very worried about you being out at this time of night, and I wouldn't want you out at this time of night. And I said, okay, why? And he said, well, because he said, the racists are targeting women who look like you. You're their first victim. And I feel really scared. I feel really worried about you. And I said, well, that's really kind, because he was being very genuine. And I said, but you don't need to worry about me. I'm okay. And he said, yeah, but I am worried about you. Anyway, so this conversation went on a bit longer. <laughs> okay. And then I said to him, well, I said, the thing is, right, I said, you're worried about me, which I just genuine, and I thank you for that, given that you're a stranger. But I said, what's worse then, women like me just staying indoors, mm -hmm. not going out, not doing our work? Because I said, that's how these people win. That's how extremists win. And then I said to him, I said, listen, should I tell you something? And he's like, yeah, go on. <coughs> and I said, I used to work as an aid worker for 15 years. And my last job was in Northeast Nigeria, where I was working with women and girls impacted by the violence of Boko Haram and the subsequent violence of the Nigerian military, right, and military operations. And I said, those women and girls, they're told to never leave. They're told to never leave their homes. They're told to never leave their refugee camp. They're told to sit indoors. And I said, extremists have done that to them. Right? And I said, I know that extremists are now targeting women who look like me because gendered Islamophobia and racism is becoming a thing increasingly everywhere, right? So I said, so why, it's like, why, why are you trying to police, police me? And then he kind of thought about it and he said, oh, he said, you've got a good argument for everything, I think. I went, yeah. So that was that, right? Um, so I went home. But it did make me think because actually um, this is what's happening increasingly to women and particularly black women and women of colour and trans women and everybody else, and men, to be very clear as well. It's like, rather, rather than people fighting or asking how the hell we've got to this point, why is it that we're not trying to stop this from becoming more and more mainstream? And final, final thing, because this really devastated me, OK? Mm -hmm. There is a term, I didn't know this term existed, it's called something like train, train track anxiety. I was like, what, well, what's that? Train track anxiety is when hijabi women, women who wear hijab, fear that they're going to be thrown, pushed under a train by people on a platform because of their identity. So they back themselves up against the train station. And I've, I've found myself doing that in the last five, 10 years. I've, I've increasingly, and then when I've caught myself doing this, I'm like, whoa, what's going on? And that's actually scared me more that I've been doing that um, without knowing I've been doing it than any extremist. And that's a genuine fact because it's made me think, oh my God, I'm letting them win. 
But, you know, it's, your, my safety and everyone's safety is a very serious issue. When you know you're on far right watch list, when you know all these things are going on, you know, you have to take care of yourself. Um, so this is why, for me, the national, the local, everything is interconnected. And the more we start seeing that, the more politics will get better, inshallah, and we'll start building the type of societies that will, most of us deserve, right? Thank you so much for that call to action to not let them win, for merging the personal and the political in ways that are so profound and genuinely so thoughtful, uh, and for a wonderful conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> yeah.